In the book of Ephesians, Paul wrote a letter to explain who we are and what we have in Christ. At the time in history that Paul wrote this letter, Christians were on the run. They had no rights. They were in great danger. Paul actually wrote this letter while on house arrest in Rome. And despite his circumstances, Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, describing the fullness and richness of life in Christ. The letter to the Ephesians explained what it meant to be in Christ, to be the church, the body of Christ. Paul knew that if the Ephesians understood who they were and began to live in Christ, the world would never be the same. The same can be true for our church today. If we understand what it means to live in Christ, to be the church, our city and our world would never be the same. Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. If you are tuning in from somewhere else, welcome again to somewhere else. We're really spoiled here in Florida, I think. It rains and we're like, ah, it's raining. I'm not going to leave the house today. It's like snow. When you live here long enough, it's a big deal. People are pretty bad drivers too in it. Did you notice that? Ugh. Last week, I talked about vacationing here in Naples. I made the joke, nobody is from Naples. Hyperbole, of course. Now people are having kids here, and now someone is from Naples. But a lot of us went through that cycle, right? We vacation down here, we vacation down here, we vacation down here. And we ask the critical question, and we go back up north. Why? Why am I doing this? A lot of people will come and they'll visit and they're like, oh, I'm from Michigan or some cold place. They leave and I'll say, see you real soon. <laughs> it's really nice down here. Well, when we came down here, we started vacationing, we used my parents' condo. So we had that luxury of doing that. We didn't have to pay for a place until they started charging us rent. But anyway, <clears throat> we would come down here, use the condo, but a lot of people don't have that luxury, and I talked to some who have timeshares. Interesting. Someone <laughs> already went, oh. Some have good experiences with them. Others, oh, already. It's kind of weird. I never got involved in it because there was a whole industry around getting out of them. So I figured, there's got to be a reason for that. Let's pass on that. Some say there are a lot of strings attached. It's kind of like being in a bad relationship. This morning, we're going to talk about relationships. Ephesians chapter 5. One of those relationships will be marriage. Marriage is like a guitar. It doesn't work without the strings. But when the music stops, the strings are still attached. <laughs> Last week, we talked, it took you a minute, <laughs> we talked about living in the now and leading by example. This week, we'll talk about relationships and family. We're going to hop right in. But before we do that, I want to explain a little something to you. We run into another awkward chapter break here. If you're reading the whole letter and you're looking at the numbers, it's weird. I told you before, these original, the originals didn't have all these numbers in them. They were added a thousand-ish years later for reference purposes. Right? So we joked about this. Imagine writing an email and like putting numbers in it so the person knew you could reference it, like an argumentative email. Well, you'll see in chapter 2, verse 3, I said this. Imagine that, and having the headings describing what you were about to talk about. You know what I mean? Like, 
<laughs> Heather reams out the roofing company. You know what I mean? Like, and then <laughs> she goes through. <laughs> Imagine that. So it's kind of funny. And when you get really into these letters and really familiar with them, the numbers will start to bother you. They get a little annoying, especially here. Because the beginning-ish to middle of chapter 5, Paul's wrapping up what he already talked about in chapter 4. And then he starts talking about all these relationships, family things. And he continues the children at the top of 6. And then it's another thought in the middle of 6. So if you open your Bible and you get one of those small print Bibles that I can't read anymore where you can see many chapters at once, you'll notice that. When you trace a line, you'll say, that's kind of a weird chapter break. Why did they do that? I don't know. I talked about the structure and these kind of concentric circles of Christ in this letter. And you could think of it two different ways. They both work. One way to think of it is he starts with Christ, and it's like a pebble in the water, and it ripples out. And then it goes from Christ to different people groups, Jews and Gentiles. It goes from that to the church, the body of Christ. And then we have all these different relationships. Or you could think of it starting really big, big theology, Jesus. And it works its way in more and more narrowly. So we'll look at some of these very specific relationships, starting with husbands and wives. Now, yes, I talked about vacationing here in Naples and what I used to do. And if you remember, I said I used to let let my wife drive everywhere down here, right? Husbands, the men like to drive, right? That's the masculine thing to do. We're the men, of course, we're better drivers. I don't know if that's true. I'm not gonna say much about that right now. But anyway, it stresses me out, especially down here in Naples. I don't like it at all. So you drive, that's fine. I'll just take a vacation. I'm not sure if it's very good for the relationship. I'll get back to you on that. but. We've been doing it for years. So, husbands, yes, it's okay to let your wife drive. Wives, you can drive your husbands around, just don't drive them crazy. Ephesians 5, starting at verse 22, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands and everything. Wait. Husbands. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead... She will be holy and without fault in the same way. Husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Some versions say one flesh. This is a great mystery. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Did you notice that the instructions for the husband are way longer? <laughs> My wife is laughing. Maybe we need a little more instruction. I don't know. And check this out. If we keep reading the whole Bible, we end up in 1 Peter eventually, and we see similar instructions there. 1 Peter 3, 7, there's instructions for wives. We'll get to that in a second. But the husbands, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should Ooh, so your prayers will not be hindered. Pretty serious. A man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Ephesians is indeed about unity. This is the key. 
It is the practical matter of thinking of the other person, not just yourself. Matthew 7, 12, this is the law and the prophets. That's what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, that we treat other people the way we want to be treated. The golden rule, Heather talked about it a few weeks ago. Now, if you ever had this happen to you, I know my wife has, <laughs> hear about it every now and then. You ever have someone you're really close to treat you really poorly, and then say something like, this is how I treat people I get close to. You ever had that happen? They kind of abuse the relationship or the friendship, right? Like, I can be real with you, so it's okay to totally abuse you. They get too comfortable. It's not being real. It's being abusive and manipulative. This applies to our spouses, too. We need to be real. We do need to get comfortable, but not that comfortable. We should never be comfortable with abuse. So the golden rule is like an umbrella over all situations. But underneath it, we need to get a little bit more specific. You see, it assumes, it assumes that we want what's best for ourselves, right? And also what's best for that person. But we ought not to assume and there's a saying that I'm not going to say because I'm in church. You might know it. Practically, <laughs> you, you have to totally put yourself in the other person's shoes. That's really the key. You need to think of practical things to do for them. Spouses, your spouse, not just to make their lives easier, but to make it a joy. That's really the goal. But, again, you need to put yourself in their shoes, not your shoes. Big difference. We need to treat them the way they want to be treated. When we don't do that, it's kind of like bringing a gift for yourself to someone else's birthday party. Do you ever see anyone do something like that? <laughs> They give a gift that they want for themselves, knowing the other person is not going to want it. No, you keep it. I've seen that kind of thing happen. Remember I talked about strings being attached to things. I heard a story of a couple, a married couple. They didn't agree on anything. They wanted to buy a timeshare, and they couldn't agree on it. They liked different things, so they tried to resolve it by buying two timeshares. Must be nice. <laughs> oh, boy. In two different places. So the wife, she was like a surfer girl, right? so she bought one in Hawaii so she could surf. The husband didn't like that at all. He bought his in the Swiss Alps so he could ski. Now, they were pretty smart people, so they knew it would be obvious if they bought gifts for one another that were clearly for themselves. They didn't do that. They took it up a notch. They got a little manipulative. You see what they did is they would buy each other gifts that could only be used at their timeshare. <laughs> Think about it. So one Christmas, the wife buys the husband a surfboard. Now, I guess you could use it. Skiing with it? Snowboarding? I don't know if it'll work. That little fin thing on the bottom. I don't have to ask Mindy. She's laughing already. Now you know what the husband does. He buys her skis. Kind of interesting. Doesn't work too well in Hawaii, right? Can you ski with those on the water? I don't know. Now I've recommended something to you guys in the past, and I'll just say it again, it's worth mentioning if you're new here. I talked about the five love languages. It's a really good thing to do. You can actually, um, if you don't like to read, <laughs> you can go online and you can take the quiz. And I recommend every couple does this. It's really, really, really good because it teaches you what your spouse likes, how they receive love. You can give someone love in the way that you 
want to receive it, but they probably won't receive it like that. I've talked about this before, so I'm just going to, I'm not going to go for a long time on that today. Five love languages, look it up, take the quiz with your spouse, it's a good thing to do. We need to give the ones we love the gift that they want to receive, not the gift we want to receive or even give, if that makes sense. And there shouldn't be any strings attached. A big part of really loving someone is knowing what that gift is. Children. You knew it's, it was coming, Sophie. Ephesians 6, 1. We're in the next chapter. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will not die. Remember, <laughs> now, remember what I said about the Proverbs. Everybody's like, kind of. <laughs> you will live long in the land. I think that's what the more traditional versions say. I had to correct it. Anyway, I'll get an email tomorrow about that. <clears throat> the Proverbs. It does say, honor and obey. Listen to your elders, your parents. If you read it enough, it's kind of like written by parents to children. It's kind of the way the Proverbs are set up. But here's a question. I think we addressed this a little bit. What if those parents are fools? What do the Proverbs say about listening to fools? Should we do that? No. There's a little monkey wrench there. What do we do? What if they aren't obeying God's commands or living godly lives? Then you shouldn't listen to them. It's interesting. Like a lot of other things, we read what we want to read, and then we stop. But we need to keep reading. But wait, there's more. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. You see, mothers and fathers are to be honored. But mothers and fathers, don't abuse it. Don't provoke. Don't manipulate. If you do that as parents, you should expect to lose some of your rights. Plain and simple. It's kind of interesting to me. We understand this in the world, right? We leave the church building, we get in our cars, and we get this. We know that if we drive like maniacs everywhere, we could probably lose our license. We could lose some of our rights if we're not following the rules. But don't you think that also applies to Christianity? I do. So what happens? When a father is provoking his child, well, he should expect to lose some of those rights. Speaking of gifts with strings attached, have you ever seen a parent who constantly reminds their children or child about all the things they've done for them? You, maybe you experienced it, and then uses it to manipulate. As a parent, I am a parent, those things that I did for my child that's called doing my job. That's it. Being a parent is a privilege. Amen? There are many people who cannot be parents naturally. So if you can, you should be thankful every day for that honor and privilege. It's nice to feel appreciated, but when we manipulate, we sin. And we sin against our children, we should expect to lose some of those privileges. How horribly common is it to see parents manipulating their children from childhood all the way into adulthood? It seems like it never stops. And I tell these children when they become adults, you can honor your parents from afar. We always, hear me, we always have to love and forgive. Always. There's no condition. There's no but after that. Love your neighbors yourself. But no, we have to love and forgive. 
But you don't have to forget. That's the important thing. You see, unlike the other relationships we're talking about, now we're going to talk about slaves, and I'm going to change that to the workplace so it fits in our context today. But unlike the other relationships, being a child is not something we choose. We need to think of it that way. So parents should be extra loving in light of that fact. You don't force someone into a relationship and then make it anything other than a total joy with discipline, but that should be the goal in relationships. Notice the scripture Paul used when talking about marriage, Ephesians 5.31. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Parents, when their children enter into this union, it must be respected. It takes priority. I hear a lot about mother-in-laws and father-in-laws causing division in a family unit, in their child's new families. The spouses have to protect one another from that. This new union takes a position of priority. If a parent is causing upset and division in their child's new family, the child's duty is to protect their family. Again, the parent worthy of being listened to should be following God's commands. And this command about not provoking your children is one of them. If they're in sin, causing problems, you can honor from afar. You need to love them. You must honor your parents, but you don't have to honor their sin. Slaves. Thank God we don't have that in this country any longer. But they did then. They also had bond servants, bond slaves, things like that. That's why some translations change it. So today, let's think of this as employees, workers, in the modern context, honoring people in the workplace. Workers, Ephesians 6, 5, slaves or employees, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. As slaves of Christ, almost laughed there. Do people do this? Do you do that at work? All right, what are you doing on the computer when you're not being watched and then what do you start doing all of a sudden when you are? <laughs> As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm. <laughs> As though you were working for the Lord rather than people. Excellent perspective. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. And we can think of this as advice for the Christian in the workplace. And the same is true here, like the gifts. It's not a good idea to tell your boss how things should be done <laughs> or to go about doing things the way we want them done. It's a good discipline to practice obedience. Don't ask questions. The Lord will reward it. Employers, Ephesians 6 and 9, masters, employers, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. So what's the point? Let's hop back over to 1 Peter 3 and look at the preceding verses. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. This is the point, if you read the New Testament a lot, being made over and over and over again. It is especially clear in Titus. Titus is a really interesting letter. It is from Paul to Titus, who's like an overseer, church planter, elder kind of guy. He leaves him in Crete. So there's a certain structure to the letter. He says, I left you in Crete for this reason, to appoint elders in every town. And then he goes into the qualifications for elders, blameless, husband and one wife, et cetera, et cetera, warns about false teachers. Then he gets to the real meat of what he's talking about. And he goes through lists of different people and tells them how they should behave, just like this, but it's a little faster. 
So it's like you, Titus, you behave this way. Older men, you behave that way. Older women, you behave that way. And it kind of cuts through. And what we do quite often when we read these letters is we just go, blah, 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 blah. you know, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. That's how they should behave. Pay attention. There's something in the meat of that which is interesting because the point is you want to win people over with their behavior, right? So Titus is going to set up this church, and what are we going to do? Well, we're going to attract people to the faith, right? So no matter where we are or who we are, whether we're slaves, he talks about that, whether we're workers, wherever we are, we want to be on our absolute best behavior. We want to act like Christ, right? We want to be washing feet, not just getting the job done but making our employers' lives a joy. Think about it. They're going to start asking questions. Man, why is that person so happy? When we're a grouch all the time, how can we be grouchy and be like, well, yeah, Jesus is coming back. That's great. You know, it's not good. We're not being good witnesses. We don't always, always have to be happy, but we want to make people's lives a joy. It's important, but here's the thing. He says something really interesting that most people don't catch. When he's talking about the behaviors, he says that something is possible here when we behave badly, that we can slander, slander God's word. That's what it says in there. Nobody notices that. There's something else to it, too. Once you start reading in the Greek, it says blaspheme God's word. That's serious. When we behave badly, and he talks about the women being gossips and stuff like that, when we do that, we blaspheme God's word. That's serious stuff. No one seems to focus on it, though. He makes another point worth looking at. Titus 2, 12. We should live in this evil world with wisdom. I'm going to stop the tour bus for a second and point something out. Side note, I see a lot of Christians acting surprised. It's kind of interesting. You see, the more I read my Bible, the less surprised I am. I see people posting all these things like, ah! <laughs> getting all upset about it. I see these things happen, and I go, yeah. The more I read my Bible, it says that. It's been like that. I told you there's nothing new under the sun. It was crazy then. It's crazy now. But some Christians act like the world should be something other than evil. Huh? Then why would Jesus have to come back? Why would the world go, gone, no sun, no earth, nothing? New heavens, new earth. Think about it. But it says it over and over again. We should live in this evil world. But listen, with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. See, just because the world's evil doesn't mean we can join in and start being all grouchy and argumentative and all that other stuff. No. Despite all this stuff going on, we need to live in the world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day and the glory of our great God and Savior, proof text for Jesus' divinity, by the way, Jesus Christ will be revealed. That should be on our minds. This was one of the main points I had last week. We need to live in the now while focused on Christ, his return. And our actions matter to those we are leading and to those we're trying to attract to the faith with this good behavior. And here's a little but. Communication's key. We need to show the love of Christ with our actions, but communicating Christ with our words is critical. Very, very important. We need to attract people to the gospel with and without words. Maybe, maybe you've heard this phrase in church. A lot of pastors like it. At all times, preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. You ever hear that? Maybe St. Francis said it. I don't know, but you know what? It's only half right. It's the problem with these short phrases sometimes. They sometimes leave a critical element out. 
It's like Batman theology I was talking to Jonathan about. Just big idea, right? A lot of people like to do that. The big idea, here it is, pow, and here's the catchphrase for the day. But it's not the whole thing. It's kind of pandering to people's impatience a little too much, in my opinion. <sighs> Remember the selfish couple who bought those gifts that could only be used at their timeshares? Well, there's a little bit more to the story, a little lesson on communication. The wife, she read 1 Peter 3, started getting a little convicted. She said, all right. I'll listen to Pastor Gene a little bit. She started doing little things, little things. They started to matter. The husband started noticing. Wow, that's interesting. Got his attention. She's changed. Why? This is interesting. And the little things added up, added up, added up. But she started getting really convicted. She said, you know what? I'm tired of the game. I'm tired of manipulating. See, kind of interesting, when you start this righteous living thing, there's a contrast in your life. The difference starts to bother you a little bit. Are you person A or person B? So she started to think, what if I get rid of person B? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm all in now. I'm going to sell the timeshare in Hawaii. Gone. She made a little money off of it, oddly enough. <laughs> she decided to use that money to buy a round-trip ticket for her and her husband to his timeshare on a private jet, non-refundable, serious stuff. And she was going to surprise him for Christmas, bought him a custom pair of ski boots. I guess he can do that, right? Stole one of his shoes, sent it out, measured it up. His initials on the side of the ski boots. It was going to be fancy. It's a surprise for Christmas. Well, in the meantime, the husband just keeps noticing. He likes wife A, <laughs> the nice wife, all the nice things that she's doing. And he gets convicted. He reads 1 Peter 3, the whole thing. And you know what? I'm tired of this manipulation. I'm going to sell my timeshare. Whoa. He sells it, does a similar thing, buys the round trip ticket and a custom surfboard that she can use at her house. Hang it on the wall now. You see, communication impacts the destination. As Christians, our communication can have a great impact on someone's ultimate destination. That is why we need to communicate in both word and deed. In relationships, communication is key. And so is spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like I said last week, if we don't communicate in word and we only communicate in deed, we're just doing busy work. That's all it is. We're not getting them to the gospel. So this is why we need to first attract people to us. We do this in relationships. We need to do this as well in Christianity. That's how it's done. Then, but then, we need to communicate. This is the key to all successful relationships. We need to live in the now, leading by example, attracting those around us by love to faith in Jesus Christ and to be about the business of communicating our great expectation of his return when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters, and may God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you love with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.